Okay, so today um, this webinar will be split into three sections. Um, I will be doing the first bit. I'm James Scott, Senior User Support Officer, uh, which does the training and secure lab. I'll be doing the initial parts. Uh, then I'll hand over to my colleague Christine, um, and she will be talking about how data sets are structured and how to apply and that kind of thing. Um, and then finally, uh, in the last section, I'll be handing over to Beata. Um, who will be talking um, about some new stuff that we haven't actually had in this webinar before. Okay, Okay. so broadly what we're going to cover today are business survey areas and the data available. Um, I will also have a quick look at some examples of research um, and then as I kind of intimated earlier, how to apply to access these data um, and then um, how to access uh, international business data as well. Um, in terms of in general terms, really, I suppose, um, for uh, business microdata, just some general aspects of it. I mean, ONS conducts a range of business surveys. Uh, the majority uh, of them are collected under statute and are compulsory. Um, some data, you know, it really is available for most business organisations in the UK, and these are divided into reporting units, enterprises, and local units. Uh, and Chris will explain more about uh, the structuring of those uh, later on. Uh, many of these data sets, you'll have you know low-level geographies such as postcode is obviously very useful. Um, and many of these business data sets can be linked together. And again, um, there will be a little bit more about this later on. Uh, generally, what happens is with these surveys is that large businesses will receive a long form and small businesses will receive a shorter form, which so it, um, you know, it's what mitigates the burden on a smaller company, really. Okay, so for ease, really, today, what we've done is we've kind of split some of these business data sets um, into sort of specific areas. So we'll look at you know, broad areas that there's some, some of them fit into. So you can see here that we have... Uh, innovation, research and development, um, earnings and skills, productivity and employment relations, international trade and foreign direct investment, and the environment. So these are, these are five broad areas that you, you may be interested in. Um, so we'll look at those in, in fairly, fairly broad terms. Let's start with innovation, research and development. Um, we can have a look at a few data sets that uh, fall into this, uh, this sort of bracket, if you like. Um, firstly, we have the e-commerce survey. Now, that's the only survey to measure ICT activity in e-commerce within UK businesses, including foreign-owned. Uh, it samples UK businesses from most SIC codes, um, though there are a few excluded, and it covers approximately 5,000 to 10,000 businesses. Uh, next, we have the IIA, the Investment and Intangible Assets Survey. Um, this looks at UK businesses in production and service sectors with 10 or more employees um, that are registered for VAT um, and or PAYE. Uh, it covers approximately 840 to 1180 businesses. As well as R&D, um, there are also a wider range of intangibles such as training, software, branding, design uh, and business process. All those things are covered as amongst other things. Um, next, we have a, a fairly widely used data set, the BIRN, the Business Expenditure on Research and Development. Uh, this supplies data for policy purposes on science and technology, and it's used by the OECD uh, and Eurostat um, for international comparisons. It covers approximately 3,500 to 26,000 organizations, and it looks at in-house expenditure on research and development and how much is bought in. Uh, last one in this list is the UKIS, the UK Innovation Survey. Uh, this is quite widely used, so we'll, we'll have a closer look at this one. Okay, so the UKIS is a Europe-wide uh, Europe community innovation survey, and it's actually the main source of information on business innovation in the UK. Uh, and it looks at general business information, good services and process innovation, the context for that innovation, and it's based on firms with more than 10 employees. Uh, it covers approximately 16,000 enterprises. Um, also, um, what it does is it represents the UK's contribution to the Europe-wide uh, Community Innovation Survey, the CIS. And its purpose, um, really the purpose of the survey is to collect information about business innovation in the UK. And an enterprise is defined as being active in innovation if it has A, introduced a new or significantly improved good service or process, B, engaged in innovation projects that are not yet complete, 
C, engaged in longer term innovation activities such as basic research and development or technology watch. D, had innovation related expenditure or E, formally cooperated with other enterprises or institu institutions on innovation. And it covers quite a lot really. Um, some of the th things that it does cover, <coughs> excuse me, types of activity, um, we can see here, this, this is a snapshot really, um, internal and external R&D, computer hardware and software, training, changes to product service and design, market research, launch advertising, advanced machinery, acquisition of external knowledge, changes to product or service design. So you can see it covers a fairly wide range of things. Um, a little snapshot here of some uh, some of the research that's uh, come off the back of using uh, using these these data. Um, this is really you know, the tip of the iceberg. Really, there's, a, there's an awful lot more than this, but just to give a, a sense of the range of things uh, that can be covered here. Uh, I mean, we're looking really topic wise here: at immigration, uh, persistence and change, financing versus knowledge, intangible assets, universities. And even within that, that five, you can see there's a, a fair a fair range of things that uh, that can be done. As I say, that that's that's really just the tip of the iceberg. Okay, let's have a look at the next sort of broad area. Uh, we can have a look at earnings and skills. So firstly, we have the new earnings survey. Uh, there are various years available for this. They're not all secure access. Um, there are panel data sets available by secure access uh, for 1986 to 2002. 1975 to 2016. Um, there's also the Occupational Pension Scheme Survey. Uh, this is a detailed view of occupational pension provision in the UK by organisation and it covers membership, contributions, transfers, increases, that kind of thing. Uh, next we have the Monthly Wages and Salaries Survey. This is the main source of information for three key indicators of short-term earnings generated by the Office for National Statistics and these three are average earnings index, average weekly earnings, and the index of labor costs per hour. This is distributed monthly to approximately 8,800 businesses and covers about 12.8 million employees. Next, we have the National Employer Skills Survey. This mostly includes information about skills deficiencies and workforce development to inform government policy. Then uh, we have the Scottish Employer Skills Survey, which is, as the name would imply, really is just focusing on you know, the, the same as the previous one, but just focusing on Scotland. Okay, um, one that's very widely used, which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail, is the Annual Survey of Hours and Earnings, also generally known as the ASH. Let's have a, a closer look at that one. Okay, so the ASH uh, has a 1% sample of individuals approximately uh, 140,000 to 185,000. That's from national insurance records. Uh, you can construct a panel data set. Uh, the employer completes this, so it's considered sometimes to be more accurate than some surveys. Um, it will include data on wages, powered, uh, paid hours of work, age, pension arrangements, occupation, industrial classifications, that kind of thing. Um, it also includes information on bonuses, overtime, uh, pensions, gender, industry, occupation, all these kind of things. The low pay commission use ASH uh, to provide evidence on the impact of the minimum wage, which is crucial for evidence-based recommendations. The official published data is not available at sufficient level of detail, so uh, access to the microdata is essential. Um, okay, so here are some examples uh, of some research that's come out of use of the ASH data. Uh, we can see here that, we've, uh, again, even within just a handful of uh, examples, we're covering quite a range of things. So effects of road construction on wages, industry knowledge spillovers, productivity investments and profits, uh, and the effects of incentive pay. Um, so yeah, it's quite a, quite a wide range of things that can be done with the ASH. Let's have a look at our next broad area, which is productivity and employment relations. And we'll start with the annual respondents database uh, and annual business survey. Um, so uh, the art, uh, well, no, we've got the, the business structure of the database. Sorry. We also have the monthly production inquiry as well and the workplace and employment relations survey. 
Um, okay, so we're going to go through these and look at these in more detail. So let's firstly have a look um, at the R, the Annual Respondents Database. Um, so this is a census of large businesses and a stratified sample of smaller ones. It's created out of other surveys, the ABI 1 and 2, uh, which are converted into a single consistent format linked by IDBR references over time. And the data are in two parts, employment and financial. Uh, you'll be able to see the differences in productivity between firms with different organizational structures. Um, and it will cover employment, turnover, purchases, capital and other expenditure and income across sectors. It has over 100 key economic variables. Um, as I said, the data are in two parts. Uh, the ABS, the Annual Business Survey, replaced ARD in 2008, although it only collects financial data. Employment data at this point was collected by the Business Register and Employment Survey. Now let's have a look at the related uh, data set, the ARD-X. I should have said, obviously, various geographies down to postcode, and that applies to many of the, the business data sets. Um, so the Annual Respondents Database X, the ARD X, was deposited in the summer of 2016. Uh, this was created by researchers at the ONS uh, Virtual Microdata Laboratory, as was, uh, which is now the SRS, um, and also uh, staff at the University of West of England. And what this does is it allows users of ARD to continue uh, their analysis, even though the Annual Business Inquiry, which was used to create ARD, ceased in, 20, uh, in 2008. Um, and it contains harmonized variables from 1998 to 2014. Um, so it's essentially created from two ONS surveys, the Annual Business Inquiry and the Annual Business Survey. Uh, the ABI has an employment survey, ABI 1, and the second survey for financial information, the ABI 2. Um, okay, well, so let's, let's have a look. What have we had out of here in terms of research? Again, you know, there are some examples of publications that have come out, and there's a, a wide range of topics, even within this tiny snapshot. So we can look at uh, stuff on outward foreign direct investment strategies, regional selective assistance, migration of productivity, um, the effects of, of, of national minimum wage. Um, and obviously, there's an awful lot more you can do with it as well. This is merely uh, you know, a small snapshot, a small example. Okay, looking then at the business structure database, the BSD, um, this covers uh, employment turnover, uh, standard industrial classification codes, legal status, foreign ownership, and as birth and death codes. Uh, the data are divided into enterprises and local units, and as I said earlier, um, Christine will talk more about that and the, the structure of these data sets uh, a little bit further on. Um, it covers up to 4 million enterprises and up to 5.5 million local units. Um, the geography is very, very wide on this, uh, everything from government office regions down to postcode level. Also, the BSD contains a small number of variables for almost all business organisations in the UK, derived from an IDBR snapshot, complemented with ONS business surveys. Let's now have a look at the monthly production inquiry. Um, and this uh, has information on turnover, export turnover, employees. Um, and it provides 75.5% of the current price turnover data used in the compilation of the index of production. Uh, also provides over 90% of the data used to estimate the number of employees in the production industries. Um, the monthly production inquiry is designed really to meet the government need for the production of a monthly uh, index of production, and it's used to estimate the change in total number of employee jobs in the production industries each month. Um, it also provides 16.5% of the output measure um, of GDP. So, yeah, again, very useful. Okay. Um, so let's have a look at uh, employment relations. Um, so within this sort of category, we already have uh, the workplace uh, and employment relations survey. This has a cross-section survey of managers, a cross-section survey of employee representatives, and another of employees. Um, now within the first, um, the cross-section survey of managers, uh, this really has information on recruitment and training consultation and communication, employee representation, pay determination and payment systems, grievance and discipline, equal opportunities, and also things like work-life balance, health and safety, flexibility, establishment performance, change, attitudes to work. So it's quite, quite far-reaching, really. 
Um, then we have the cross-section survey of employee representatives. Uh, and this has information on the structure of that representation uh, at the workplace, uh, the time spent on representative duties, means of communication with employees, incidents of negotiation and consultation over pay and other matters, uh, involvement in redundancies, discipline and grievance matters, incidents of collective disputes and industrial action, um, union recruitment, that kind of thing. Uh, in the final cross-section survey, this one of, of employees, uh, we're looking at things like working hours, job influence, job satisfaction and working arrangements, training and skills, information and consultation, employee representation and pay. Um, so yeah, again, you know, there's quite a lot of information here. Um, some research topics, some research that's come out of, uh, of using these. Uh, we have things here on multi-skilling, disability and earnings, workplace performance and loyalty, and the gender pay gap, just within this, this small amount of examples. Okay, let's look at the international trade of foreign direct investment. Um, in that broad area, we have a couple of examples, really. Uh, we have the annual inquiry into foreign direct investment, the AFDI, and the international trade in services. Let's have a better look at the AFDI. Okay, so that's the annual inquiry into foreign direct investment. So what we have here is info on UK companies and their foreign affiliates. Inward FDI that relates to foreign direct investment into the UK. And as you might imagine, outward FDI relates to investment by UK-based companies overseas. Covers approximately 8,000 to 21,000 enterprises for outward and 2,000 to 35,000 for inward. Um, it's really the information uh, on UK companies and their foreign affiliates includes country of operation, their industry, uh, the percent of equity held, their operating profits, transactions, flows of equity capital, uh, acquisitions and disposals of equity capital, and the levels of investment. Surveys are sent to enterprise group heads, so really that means the headquarters of a company, which in turn may own a number of smaller companies based in the UK. Uh, the register from which the firms are sampled comes from a number of sources, uh, including HM Customs and Revenue and ONS inquiries on acquisitions and mergers. Finally, let's have a look at the last broad area, which is the environment. Uh, and here are a couple of examples um, of uh, data sets in this, this area. We have the low emissions R&D survey, and we also have the quarterly fuel inquiries. Um, so the low emissions R&D survey looks at business research and development aimed at reducing greenhouse gas emissions. It also looks at expenditure on low emissions R&D, trialing and deploying the material, product or process in a working environment on a pre-commercial basis. Um, it also looks at support from government incentives um, and lower energy consumption and renewable energy. Okay, so let's have a look at the quarterly fuels inquiry. Um, so really this is, as the name would suggest, it's a quarterly survey uh, among a panel of manufacturing plants where data are widely used both within government uh, and industry and considered a vital source. And you can see here that the data are collected on uh, a number of different fuel types, coal, coke, gas, oil, liquefied petroleum, electricity, etc. Um, this uh, There's normally uh, around 1,000 to 3,000 cases and it, ultimately, it's a statutory inquiry that is conducted under Section 1 of the, of the Statistics and Trade Act 1947. Okay, so having had, uh, you know, a reasonable sort of overview, I think, although a fairly, fairly truncated, you know, to keep you manageable, um, an overview, really, of some broad areas that the business data sets fall into, um, we really now need to have a look and see how those data sets are structured. So I will now hand you over to my colleague Christine and she will talk you through the next section. Thanks very much James and hello to you all. Um, so in this next section as James mentioned we're going to look at how these, these business data sets are structured um, and the diagram you'll see on screen here just provides a, an overview of this. So all of the um, business data sets that we hold are sampled from a file that the ONS hold, which is called the Interdepartmental Business Register. 
Um, now this is really great because it means all of the uh, all of the data sets contain consistent identifiers, which enables you to to link a range of different data sets. Um, and this obviously provides a lot more opportunity for what you can research. The file itself, so the IDBR, is a list of all UK businesses with the exception of very small businesses such as the self-employed. Other exceptions include businesses that generate turnover below the VAT threshold or which do not pay employees via the pay-as-you-earn scheme. Um, so it really includes the, the vast majority of businesses across the UK. Within the IDBR, businesses are structured according to the three, the three main identifiers you can see on screen. So we've got the enterprise group, the enterprise and the local unit. Um, and I'll just say something about these three to start with. So the enterprise group is a group which owns a number of companies and makes the legal and financial decisions about those companies. Now, not all companies will belong to an enterprise group. So typically where you have a company existing by itself, it won't have a, an enterprise group. But where you have a, you know, a large number of companies, then they will be owned by an by a enterprise group. The enterprise can be thought of as the company. And then below that, you have what are called local units, or you may be familiar with the term plants. And these are the premises that belong to the company where some economic activity occurs. Um, so, for example, a retail outlet or a factory would be considered a, a local unit. We also have what we term reporting units. And these are created by ONS for the purposes of sending surveys to collect data. So this essentially holds the mailing address to which the survey questionnaires are sent. Now, within the, the business surveys, data is generally, generally collected for the enterprise, but in some cases, you'll also have local unit data. Um, and this is good because it means you can, you can kind of aggregate data up at different levels. Most of the surveys will contain these identifiers within them, so you can, you can as I've said, use them to, to aggregate data up. And just to show you how this works in practice now, so you can see on the, the left-hand side of the screen, we have quite a, a simple company structure, if you like. So we have one enterprise, the Island Cafe, which is a company. Um, it has one local unit, which is the Island Cafe on Mersey Island. Um, it's just one, one operating location, so we don't have an enterprise group in, in this case. And then on the right-hand side of your screen, you can see a slightly more complex um, organisation. So we have an enterprise group, Restaurants PLC, which owns two enterprises or two companies. The first is Fast Food Company and the second is Dining Company. And as you can see, Fast Food Company has two local units, Burger World and Chicken Express, whereas Dining Company just has the one, the Vine. So in terms of how this would look in the data set, obviously fast food company and dining company will share the same enterprise group code, um, but they'll have different enterprise codes. And likewise, the local units Burger World and Chicken Express will have separate local unit codes, but will share the same enterprise code. The Vine will have its own local unit code, and that will share the, have the, the same enterprise code as dining company. So hopefully that just gives you a bit of an overview of what the what these data look like. As I've mentioned, one of the really positive things is that we can we can link these data sets, and, and this is what our researchers using these data do. So here on screen you can see just some of our most common linkages. So a lot of researchers link the annual survey of hours and earnings to the workplace employment relations survey. The business structure database is um, typically or quite often linked to the UK Innovation Survey. The annual respondents database often linked to the Workplace Employment Relations Survey. And then again, the annual survey of hours and earnings is, is often linked to the Employer Skills Survey. It's great that we can link these data sets, but it does require permission from the, the data owner. Um, so if, if you wish to link these, these data sets, we, we, we are required to um, gain permission from ONS to do this. Um, this can be done through your application process, which I'll talk a little bit about shortly. Um, or if you, if you gain access to these data and decide at a later date you want to, to link data sets, then we can, we can contact the data owner to request that permission on your behalf but just make you, making you aware that the permission is required. 
So we have an opportunity for questions at the moment. So if you have any questions at all about the, um, the studies that James has, has talked about or anything about the, the data linkage or the structure, then, then feel free to, to add them in via the, the questions box on, your, on the right-hand side of your screen. So I'll just give you a few minutes and we'll just see if we have any, have any questions. We've got a question in relation um, to ITIS, um, which we haven't talked about in a in a in great depth today. But if you do have any any specific queries about that, then we're we're you know very happy to to kind of take them outside of today's session. Um, on our on our website, we have a set of online forms, and there's a specific uh, uh, form for data queries. So if you do have some specific questions about that or want to um, find out more then then do feel free to get in touch and we also have quite a lot of useful information on our on our website so you can search for the for the study on our website and, and have a look at you know, there's an abstract there documentation etc so so there is some additional information there and as I say very happy to to answer any specific questions you have about it I uh, have a comment just to say it's a helpful overview, so that's great. Um, yeah, and just a, another question about sharing slides. So following the, the webinar, we will put a copy of the the webinar on our website and um, we can send a link around as well and uh, or if you have a look on our website actually there's a section for webinars then um, we can put them up and uh, and uh, yeah you can have a look through the slides okay great there's, there's a bit more opportunity for questions at the end as well so if we keep moving through now and then um, we can come back after to some more questions So I'm just going to go through now the, the application process uh, for applying to access any of these business data sets. Um, it's a four-step application process. So the first step is finding the, the data set you wish to use. Um, second step is applying to use it via the UK data service. Um, and then the next, the final kind of two steps are completing an accredited researcher application form and then once your, your application is approved, um, you would attend a training course and pass the associated test. So let's have a look now at this in a bit more depth. So your first step, finding the data. Um, if you go to our website, which is www.ukdataservice.ac.uk, and you can see that there is a, a search box uh, just at the top of the screen. Best thing is to come is to go to this page and enter your your search terms. So you can see here that we have entered the term business innovation, and we have we have quite a lot of results here. We have 124 results. Uh, fortunately, we're able to to kind of narrow down the search a little bit more. So you can see on the left hand side of your screen, there are a number of different facets you can use. So you have the the date. Um, we have some data that goes goes way back. So we have some data on markets and fairs in England and Wales to 1516. Um, I don't think there's quite as much on the business data going back that far, but yeah, certainly we've got some very old data and then lots more recent stuff. So you can use these facets to, to select um, the date. We also have topics. So in relation to the, the business data, um, there's economics, uh, labor and employment. 
And then we have data type, so UK survey data, for example, historical data, cohort and longitudinal studies. And then there is access, um, three main options here, safeguarded, controlled or open. Um, I will say that all of the business data is, is controlled data, um, so that, that kind of that facet will be automatically selected, as it were. Um, and then we have country, so we have data from all over the world, and you can select the, the data that you would like to look at. You can see in our next slide here, we have narrowed down our search a little bit using the date, data type, access and country. Um, and the first study we have is the UK Innovation Survey. So let's have a bit of a closer look at that. Once you select the study, you'll just come through to what's, a, what's called a catalogue record for the, for the data set. And here you can see we have information on the principal investigators and also uh, citation details that you can use when you're, when you're citing this study. Just scrolling down a little bit further, there's an overview of the topics covered by the study. Um, there's an abstract which gives a summary of the study, including um, the geographical data available within it and how you can link it to other business studies. And then there's main topics as well. Just scrolling a little bit further down, there's information on coverage, coverage and methodology. So you can see information on the time period, the country, spatial units, observation units, and, and lots more. Um, so when you're, I guess, when you're searching for these studies, it's really useful to have a, you know, a good look at the catalogue record. It gives you a good overview of the study, the sampling process, that type of thing. So um, yeah, have a look on our website for, for this information. And then just scrolling a little bit further down, you'll see there's some, uh, well, there's a, there's a range of documentation, really. And this is really useful as it gives you a list of all the variables included in the study, the sample sizes, user guides, questionnaires, and other related files. This documentation should answer any questions you may have when you, when you start to access the data as well. So it's always worth having a really good look through, through the documentation. Once you've found the, the data set or data sets you'd like to access, then if you click on the Access uh, Data tab on there, which you can see at the moment on the top right hand side of the screen, and then you'll be provided with instructions on registering your project, ordering any additional data set, so if you wish to order more than one, um, and you'll also be asked to add any project colleagues. Once you've done this, the third step is becoming an ONS accredited researcher. And for this, you'll complete an accredited researcher form and your project colleagues should do this as well. So everyone on the project completes one of these forms. The, the lead researcher should also complete the research proposal form. And then once, once the UK Data Service has these, three, these, these sets of forms, then we will send them to the, the data owner for approval. Remember to include as much detail as possible. So on the accredited researcher form, you'll see that you're asked for um, information on your professional background. So, you, you, you know, it's worth including, oh, apologies for this pop-up coming up. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so you'll be asked for information on any papers you've published, conference presentations, etc. And also your experience of using microdata, particularly confidential, sensitive, detailed microdata. So, so do include those details. And then on the research proposal form, which is the one um, completed by the lead researcher, you'll be asked for a description of your project, um, a justification of why you need these data in particular. Um, you'll also be asked about whether you intend to link any data sets. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, it is it is a, a requirement that the data owner gives you permission for any, any data linkage. So when you're completing your application, it's worth having to think about what linkage you might like to do and, and where possible, including all the details on your, on your application form. If at a later date, once you've gained access to these data, you decide you want to carry out any linkage, then, then we can go back to the data owner to, to request permission. Um, but it obviously, it's, it's kind of more efficient if, if you put it up put it on at the, the early stage. Um, and then we'll also ask you for your research publications as well that you intend to, um, you intend to create once you've, once you've had access to the data. Uh, the final step is the, the training. Um, so 
Once we've sent the forms to the, the data owner and we've gained approval, we will offer you a range of dates to attend a, a training course, which is normally run in London. Um, it's a one-day training course. And at that training, we will cover um, five, five main areas, which you can see on the screen here. Um, so we'll show you how to, how to use the Secure Lab and how you can work safely and efficiently when you're using it. Um, we'll also look at understanding data access and the importance of having good attitudes and, and engagement when you're using these data. And then our final module is around statistical disclosure control of outputs. So once you have um, completed the training and an associated online test, once you've passed that, we will, we will issue you with your secure lab account credentials um, and then you've, yeah, you then have access to, to these data sets. So that's a bit of an overview on the, on the application process. Um, there's lots of um, further information on our website, so you can have a look at that if you, if you want to have a, have a closer look. Um, but any questions at this stage on the, on the application process? Okay, I don't think there's anything further on the application process at the moment. As I mentioned, lots of information on our website, so, so do have a look. Um, and I think now I'm going to hand you over to my colleague Beata, who um, is going to talk about access to, the, to international business data via, via the UK Data Service. Hello, good afternoon. I'm very glad to say that the UK Data Service is part of the International Data Access Network project, short IDEN, founded in 2018. The project is a collaboration between six research data centers from France, Germany, the Netherlands and the United Kingdom to facilitate research use of controlled access data between these research data centers and countries. At the moment, we have got two access points to international controlled data in our safe room here at the University of Essex. And that is one access point to facilitate on-site direct remote access to the German Institute for Employment Research Data. And um, I will refer to the German Institute for Employment Research, short as IUB. And one data access point to facilitate on-site direct remote access to the French CASD data. For information regarding IAB datasets available via our safe room, please follow the link provided on this slide highlighted in blue. Data access information can be found at the IAB data access pages. Please follow those links. This is a screenshot of the overview of available IAB data. Please have a look uh, at your own leisure. And here you can see a selection of central IAB data products, for example, LIAP, that is a linked employer employee data of the IAB. I'd like to draw your attention to the newest development regarding IDEN in cooperation with the French Secure Access Data Center, CASD. The UK Data Service has now set up a secure data access point within the UK Data Service, safe from at the University of Essex to facilitate, to facilitate on-site direct remote access to the CASD data from the UK. To get an overview of all available CASD data, please follow the link. And to apply for the data, please contact the provided email address that would be service at csd.eu. This is a screenshot of the overview of available CASD data. It lists, for example, the financial links between enterprises survey, but many more, so please have a look. And finally, I'd like to present you with a list of themes and data producers, uh, producers for your information. So you can see, for example, the Ministry of Labour is involved, the Ministry of Environment, there is data from the Central Agency for Social Security, and also from the Institute for Research and Information in Health Economics, etc., etc. And all the themes listed on the left-hand side, so it's a very rich data source. Please have a look. That's it from me. Are there any questions?
No, I can't see any. Okay, then I'm handing back to my colleagues to wrap up. Okay, thanks very much, Beata. Um, I hope you've all found the uh, the webinar useful today. Um, as I mentioned before, there is there is lots of information available on our website, so so do take a look. Um, and if you have any any queries at all about using these data, then then do complete one of the online forms on our website, and then we can we can we can obviously help you and get back with some some more information. So thanks again for your time today, and uh, yeah, we'll we'll speak to you again soon. Bye bye.